Welcome, everyone, today's session. We are going to talk about disaster recovery and high availability with Spectrum Protect. So this is what we're going to cover today. I'm going to do a little bit of overview of high availability and DR, and we'll talk about some of the available options. And then what I want to do is get into a little bit more detail about some of the high availability techniques that are available with Spectrum Protect and how you can use those to protect from what I'm calling localized disasters, uh, failures of the immediate system and failover kind of activities to recover from that. And then what we're going to do is move into talking a little bit more about disaster recovery. We'll spend a few minutes talking about Spectrum Protect's Disaster Recovery Manager. It kind of sets the base of what we're going to do after that, and that's talking about electronic vaulting techniques, and that's where I think the world is going these days with disaster recovery. So we'll look at some examples, give you some ideas, or at least give you some understanding of what techniques are out there and available to use with Spectrum Protect. My goal is um, not to make you all experts on the, the nitty-gritty of doing disaster recovery and high availability, but the title of this session implies this is more of a kind of a planning thing for you to understand what some of the options are, maybe get you thinking about how you might do DR and high availability in your environment. Let's start out by setting up some definitions. I'm really kind of talking about two things here, high availability and disaster recovery. High availability is about protecting against a localized failure, a machine that fails, or a network failure, or maybe some kind of a software failure. It's what we typically call a failover, and we use clustering technologies to deal with these kinds of failures. So it's not the kind of whole building blows up kind of thing. It's more of a my server failed or my network failed and I need to, to move to some alternate hardware uh, using the clustering technology. The other piece of what we'll talk about today is disaster recovery. And this is the kind of thing to protect against these large-scale failures where I have a loss of a facility, a building doesn't have to blow up, but it can be flood or some other kind of condition that causes me to leave my facility and go somewhere else. Or it could be some kind of a media failure. This may be more likely kind of thing. Maybe I lose all the media where my Spectrum Protect data is stored for whatever reason. Uh, large-scale disk failure or something like that, the disk subsystem fails, and, and then I need to go to some other location to, to be able to deal with that problem, to use a whole new set of hardware, you know, servers and network and storage to continue operations. The way that we deal with localized failures, as I said, is the clustering, and these are approved clustering techniques for Spectrum Protect in the AX world, we do Power HA, or we used to call that HACMP. On Windows, it's Microsoft Cluster Services. You can also use Veritas Clustering Services on a few of the platforms. And then there's typically system automation for multi-platform. So that's the clustering. When we talk about doing DR, then we need to, but we're going to recover our Spectrum Protect server in an alternate location. And that's where Disaster Recovery Manager comes in. That's primarily a tool that we'll use for recovery with physical tape. We go beyond that then, we talk about electronic vaulting. And one of the key techniques we're going to talk about there is Spectrum Protect's node replication capability. This is an old, old, old chart. It's the old seven tiers of disaster recovery, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen this chart already. It really does kind of tell the story in the right way, and that's when you're planning for high availability or disaster recovery, you have to kind of think about well, where do I fit into this continuum that this chart demonstrates. In, in other words, 
how much recovery or what level of recovery do I really need, and that's a business decision, and then how much am I willing to pay for that? And those two factors have to come together at some point. They come together on this chart. It's worth whenever you're planning for DR, planning for high availability, to stop and think about this. Where do I really need to be? I mean, how quickly do I need to recover? Because the risks are that you'll either A, pay too much for recovery that you don't really need, or B, pay too little and not get the kind of recovery that you really need. Let's start by talking about some clustering techniques and and what does clustering look like? And again, this is high availability, so we're trying to recover from the localized failure. And we use clustering techniques to do that. And this is kind of how clustering works in a general sense. Typically, what we have are in, in clustering environment are shared disk environment. So we have two physical hosts talking about they're sharing a set of disks either exclusively or maybe concurrently, but that disk is available to both systems. So if that one system fails, the other system can take over that disk and continue operation. When a system owns that disk, it looks like local disk to the host. We're not looking at some kind of a shared network resource. It really looks local, but the idea of clustering is that the alternate system can take it over and make it its local disk when it needs it. The way that you configure this up is typically the two host systems are identically configured. Each system really looks just like the other. And then it shares these resources. I talked about disk as a shared resource, but it may also be sharing other things like maybe an IP address, because we need to get at this in a, a same way the clients need to get at it. You think about Spectrum Protect, Spectrum Protect servers, clients have to have a single address to get at this clustered environment. It doesn't matter which host happens to be running the server at the time. And things like config files, maybe some other resources that exist in the environment will be shared, then crucially, automatically transferred from one host in the cluster to the other. I'm talking about this in terms of sort of a primary and a standby environment, two hosts, but most of these techniques support many hosts. There can be three, four, five, six hosts, depending on the availability that you need. Typically, in Spectrum Protect environments, I don't see more than two, but you certainly can do that. And then the last piece of, of clustering is that you have this sort of automatic detection of failures. Uh, some people call it kind of a heartbeat function, so that the, the standby host is detecting when the primary host has failed, and that failover kind of happens automatically. So one fails, the other starts up and takes over and runs things. Specifically in the Spectrum Protect environment, we have clustering functionality in both the client and the server environments. In the client environment, we're thinking about maybe something like a big old file server that is clustered, and we want to be able to back that up. And Spectrum Protect client functions in that environment just fine. It has built-in functionality to take advantage of that kind of environment. Uh, same is true for the Spectrum Protect server. We can set the server up as a protected resource so that the hardware fails or the server, it can automatically fail over to a, a new environment. This is how it looks. You have in your normal environment the active system using all of these shared resources, physical disks. Example here, this is kind of a client view of things. Spectrum Protect client, so it's it's owning these disks that contain the data that needs to be backed up, and there's a scheduler that is a shared resource that it's owning, and then the TSM client, the code itself, it's plugging along, doing backups, and if that node fails for whatever reason, the hardware software failure on that node, then we uh, flop over 
to the right-hand view on this picture, which is the failover environment where the takeover system now automatically owns these resources, the disks, the scheduler, the client, and then it continues the backups in that environment. The Spectrum Protect client is built to be able to do this kind of function. We'll look at you know, how this kind of works in several environments here. And we're talking about clients here. I'm going to break this into kind of Unix, Linux, and then the other side of it is Windows. You're going to see that they really pretty much look a, a lot alike. What's different in the Unix, Linux environment is it's a little bit more of a scripted thing. So we have these shared resources and the different nodes in the cluster. And here I'm showing a three-node cluster more typical in the client environment to see more than two nodes there. All three nodes have accessibility to the shared resource. In the middle of the picture here, that's the disk, the data that's going to be backed up. So all three nodes have accessibility to that, but only one node owns it at any given time. And that's actually the data that's going to be backed up, but it's other resources as well a password file, include, exclude list, dsm.opt or in dsm.sys.files, Spectrum Protect configuration files, and then schedule information as well. And then the last thing is start and stop scripts. And these start and stop scripts are used to cause the failover to occur. So if there's a failure, we don't have to stop anything. It stops because of the failure, but then the start scripts are used on the receiving node, the node that's going to take over. It will run the start scripts, and the scripts just basically start things up again, the scheduler and so on, make connection to the Spectrum Protect server and all of that. And that's how we affect the failover in that Unix Linux environment. Now we also see that each of the nodes have local resources, and there may be very little there in terms of local resources, but there may be resources that may be significant. The individual nodes might have data that isn't clustered, that doesn't need that kind of availability, but it still needs backup. And so you have this kind of concept of the local and shared resources. The way we configure this then in the Spectrum Protect environment is to have separate sets of schedules separate sets of config files for each of the entities that need backup. So there's the shared resources, which get their set of configuration. And then the local resources on each node have to have configuration in order to do the backup. So in this picture, we really have four sets of resources, one shared and then three local resources, all of them running backup, each getting its own node name, to the Spectrum Protect server so that we can manage backup in each of the environments. If we take a look at that same thing with Windows, really, it looks a lot the same. But the difference in Windows is we don't have the start-stop scripts. Windows does it a little bit differently. This is MSCS, by the way. Windows is using things, defined things called resource groups. This is an MSCS construct. You define these, they're stored in the registry. And this is how Windows keeps track of the shared resources. So it'll be the shared disk. It'll be things like the scheduler, password information. All of that gets defined as this resource group. And then the MSCS assigns the resource group to one of the potential nodes as an owner. So that node will be live running with that resource. And if there's a failover, then MSCS moves that resource group ownership to one of the other nodes. To make this work in a client environment, we use a special construct in the client in the dsm.op file called cluster node yes. And that just tells the BA client that what we're doing here is a clustered environment and it should be prepared to recognize the shared resources and fail them over if necessary. Now, if we turn that conversation now from the client to the server, we see, again, it's very similar. 
But in this case, what we're sharing is the resources, the resources that the Spectrum Protect server owns. We're owning the Spectrum Protect database. We're owning the instance directory, active log, archive log, all of that, any of the things that you can kind of figure out, those are the things that you configure to make a Spectrum Protect server work properly. Those are the shared resources. And so if we have a, a failover, then all of those resources ownership is transferred from the primary node to the secondary or from the active to the standby node. And that's managed really in kind of the same way that we saw in the client world. If it's Unix Linux, we're using those stop and start scripts. If it's Windows, we're using these defined resources in order to fail things over. The other thing that gets shared in a server environment is the IP address. We want the clients to be able to continue to connect so that we don't want them to have to change their connectivity information. And I know you could do that through a DNS, but even that would be kind of clunky to do. What we do in these clustered environments is you really end up with three IP addresses. If it's a two-node environment, there's a local IP address for each of the individual nodes, but then there's this shared IP address, which is the shared resource, and that's the address that the clients use to connect. So that address can be dynamically redirected via the clustering software to the appropriately running active node. This failover kind of thing is it's there for failures when hardware fails, but it's also there for kind of manually or ad hoc kind of forced failures. So if you want to change primary to secondary node, maybe because you want to put some maintenance on, on the primary node, you can do that. All of these techniques support that, that capability to kind of force the failover to occur, even if there hasn't been a real failure of hardware or software. That's kind of nice side effect of these high availability techniques. That's the high availability. I hope that kind of gives you a sense of what you can do if you need that. And remember, that's to protect against localized failures. I lose my server, I lose my network, things like that. Now we're going to change our focus and talk about disaster recovery. This is the kind of thing that we do to recover from larger scale failures. So now we're talking about not just moving the operation across the room, but moving the operation to some geographically distant location, maybe across town or maybe across the country. There's really no limit on how far these disaster recovery techniques, what the separation can be between the primary and secondary location. There's some practical considerations. You know, you have to consider how are you going to function when you get to that alternate location? I mean, that's a very important consideration. But just from a technical standpoint, this works across any distance. The key thing here, though, the difference between this and, and high availability is we're not sharing the data. We're actually moving it. We're copying it from the primary site to the recovery site. This gives us the, the highest level of recovery because any kind of failure at the primary site, from a server failure all the way up to a complete facility failure, we can recover from with these disaster recovery techniques. So getting the data from the primary to the secondary site is really kind of the key piece of this. And traditionally, we've done this by simply putting the data on physical tape cartridges, loading it in trucks, and sending it somewhere to could be an intermediate location to a vault or vaulting service like Iron Mountains, very typical kind of way that this gets done. But what's happening now is really a transition away from that into what we call electronic vaulting techniques where we send the data not by physical tape but over the network from the primary to the secondary location. That's what we're going to talk about for the rest of this session then is, you know, what, what are ways that we can do this? What are some of the considerations? One thing I'll just mention is that doing good DR really depends a lot 
on building a good recovery plan. There's a lot of things you can do to automate the DR environment. If you're willing to put a lot of money into it, you can automate it almost completely. But most people don't do that. Most people automate it up to a certain point. That means there's going to be a recovery procedure that you're going to need to go through if this happens. And it's really important that you develop and test that procedure properly because none of the rest of this is really going to matter if you don't have that procedure in place. You know, I was just talking to a company the other day. Um, they had kind of a smaller failure, but they couldn't get at their, their backup data, but they knew they had it replicated to the DR site, but they couldn't get it there either because while they were doing a good job of replicating it to the DR site, they had no procedure in place to access that data. And so it was there. They wanted it. They needed it but they didn't know how to get to it. So building the procedure is, is really, really essential if you're going to do good disaster recovery. This picture is the typical, the way we've done DR for many, many, many years with the physical tape, write the tapes at the primary site, put them on a truck, haul them to a vault somewhere. That vault could be actually at the DR site, a lot of people did that, but a lot of people also use the intermediate site that's typically a vaulting service like Iron Mountain. And then when you have a disaster, you hold the tapes over to your DR. Might be a hot site, might be a warm site, might even be a cold site, but you hauled the data there and you recovered there at that site. And doing that kind of recovery means that I'm making off-site tapes, so I have to manage those. That's where Disaster Recovery Manager comes into play. Very good tool for managing those off-site tapes. That's one of the key things it does is manage those tapes as they move through their life cycle off-site. And then there's a few other pieces that have to be protected. Your Spectrum Protect database, some config files like the volume history and device configuration. If you create a disaster recovery plan file, you have to protect that as well. And many people did this with tape encryption, and so tape encryption is a very, very important piece of doing this kind of off-site DR physical tape. If you do that, think about how do I do that? Do I I'm going to have to send my Spectrum Protect database back up off-site as well. You know, depending on how you do that encryption, you could end up with the recovery keys for the tapes in the Spectrum Protect database. Well, if that's the case, don't load that database back up on the same truck. That needs to be shipped separately, or you're sending the keys along with the lock. I have a picture here of the, the disaster recovery manager lifecycle. You know, essentially the way that works is assigning um, states to the, the cartridges as they move through their life cycle. And with these states, we can tell where the cartridges are, um, whether it's time for them to move to the vault or whether it's time for them to come back. The other piece of Disaster Recovery Manager that we've been using for many, many years is the recovery plan. It's created with the administrative command prepare, and it produces a plan for recovering your Spectrum Protect server. As we move into this electronic vaulting world, that recovery plan is still a very useful tool. So you may find that I'm no longer creating off-site tapes, then I no longer need to use the DRM tape cartridge management capabilities, but you probably will want to continue to use the plan file capabilities of DRM as you move into an electronic vaulting world. Just to set a baseline in terms of what does it take to do disaster recovery, these are kind of the basic steps that it takes. And this is, if you were going to do this with physical off-site tapes, the, these are the things that you'd have to do. And these are also the things that you'd have to do if you were doing electronic vaulting. It's just that 
some of these get a lot easier in the electronic vaulting world because you know I don't, I don't really have to identify tapes that are ready to go off-site because they're just simply copied to the off-site or replicated. The data is replicated. There really aren't even cartridges anymore in that world. But you do have to back up your database or at least get a copy of it off-site somehow. You do have to manage your plan file, um, and you do have to think about recycling. It now isn't physical tape media anymore, but it may be electronic media uh, files or such that are at the DR, and you have to think about ways of how do I manage that. That piece gets a whole lot easier in the electronic vaulting world, and it can really be automated. When you look at this list, you can kind of say, well, I can see the things that I don't have to do anymore in the electronic vaulting world, and I can see that there's a number of things here that were manual steps, you know, taking physical tapes out of the library and putting them, packaging them up, putting them on the truck or handing them over to a courier. All of that stuff goes away. And that's really, I think, the thing that's driving people to the electronic vaulting world is that all of these manual, much more error-prone steps in the process, they kind of go away. And that makes our overall DR process much more reliable, maybe much less costly, you know, depending on how you measure that. These are the reasons why people are moving away from physical tape backup and into the electronic vaulting world. Now, back to that plan file for just a second, because as I said, this tool has been useful over the years for doing disaster recovery. It continues to be useful in the electronic vaulting world. And what goes into this plan file is really all the bits and pieces that are necessary to rebuild our Spectrum Protect server at the disaster site. And depending on how you do disaster recovery, these pieces may or may not be important. If you build to kind of a hot site, then maybe your, your Spectrum Protect server, it doesn't need to be rebuilt because it's just there. It's there receiving replicated data and it's ready to go when you have a disaster, highly automated. But there are many electronic vaulting techniques that may require you to use the pieces that are in this plan file. And so don't overlook that as you're moving into the electronic vaulting world. You may or may not need to continue to use this plan file if for no other reason it produces a really kind of nice fallback kind of thing. because. If for some, doesn't happen, but if for some reason things go very bad in your DR process, and while you expected to have a functioning Spectrum Protect server there at the DR site, you find that all goes bad, well, now you've got this plan file that you can use to recover from whatever it was that went bad and rebuild your Spectrum Protect server at the DR site. Let's now kind of turn our attention to that electronic vaulting, and we'll, we'll look at some of the techniques here. Here's kind of a, a very comprehensive view of, of, at a high level, of how you might do electronic vault. You're electronically transferring over the network the copies of your backup data from your primary to your secondary or your DR site. Some people say, well, we're going to do the electronic vaulting, but you know what? We're not going to stop doing the off-site tapes. And I see this more and more. There's a couple of good scenarios, I think, where, where this kind of fits. And the first is that what I see some people doing is kind of a very localized, you know, a smaller geographic distance electronic vaulting, maybe across town. So they're going to do their electronic vaulting so that if their building gets wiped out for whatever reason, they can just fire up operations in the building on the other side of the town or maybe, you know, the other side of the county or the other side of the state. But then they use the off-site tapes to, to give it a next level of recovery. So this might be a much farther geographic distance. They may store their vaults 
halfway across the country or something like that so that if there's a regional disaster, um, they still have a chance of recovering from that by using the off-site tapes. The other scenario that I see, some companies are looking for this air gap kind of capability, which means I want to have a set of my backup data stored somewhere that is offline. It can't be accessed directly by somebody who either is a rogue actor within the company or maybe a a hacker who's broken into our system maliciously affect our data, all of the online data, which would include the electronically vaulted data, but they can't access that data that's sitting on physical tape in the vault somewhere. So we have a protection against that. And this kind of come to light a little bit more with uh, ransomware that you've, you've heard a few high profile cases of that rate lately. And the thinking is that the air gap will protect against that kind of ransomware. We'll take a quick high-level run through some of the different ways of doing electronic vaulting with Spectrum Protect. And the top of the list is going to be node replication. That's the go-to technique. If you don't have any other considerations, you don't know what you want to do, you should probably start thinking node replication because that gives you the most functionality, the highest level of recoverability, it's really kind of the very most current way that Spectrum Protect offers to do electronic vaulting. You can do a number of other things. If you just can take an attitude where, well, maybe, maybe I'm going to continue to put my storage pool data on physical tape, but I might start by electronically vaulting some of the, what we'll just generically call the metadata, the, the Spectrum Protect database, the volume history, device configuration, server options, uh, your plan file, electronically vault that to the hot site, maybe even use that to periodically build up your recovery server, maybe every day. There's always copy storage pools. I mean, copy storage pools can be written to an off-site location. There's various techniques for doing that. There are a number of hardware mirroring techniques, and we're going to look at that, um, mirroring disk, VTLs, that kind of thing. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about integrating DB2's HADR into the DR process. HADR is a way of replicating the Spectrum Protect database. HADR works with all of the current versions of Spectrum Protect. Export, import, it works. I it's an interesting way to do DR, and we have some functionality in export-import to make it work in an incremental way. Talked about vaulting, physical tape is an air gap. Interesting, I see more and more of that these days, so that's something to think about, too. If you have that business requirement, you may do the electronic vaulting and use the physical tape. DRM certainly fits into these processes as, uh, in terms of using the plan file. Because a number of these that I've listed here will require you to rebuild your server. So think about whether DRM fits. And the last point here, and bandwidth is a huge consideration. When you're headed off to electronic vaulting, you have to think right away, do I have? Can I afford? Is it justified to pay for the kind of bandwidth that it's going to take to do the electronic vaulting? So our first example here is node replication. And really, node replication, as I said, should be the kind of go-to option. If you don't have any other specific requirements that would preclude doing node replication, this is probably where you should be. Um, node replication gets your storage pool data, your metadata, in other words, the database, Spectrum Protect database data, all of it replicated, perfectly synchronized, automated fell over for recovery purposes to the uh, secondary server. So it is really the most highly functional way of doing electronic vaulting. And, and really the reason that this is, is a good technique is because all of the functionality is built into the Spectrum Protect server. So Spectrum Protect is doing all the work doing the replication. And so Spectrum Protect can be very aware 
of what's been replicated, what's not been replicated, what's the best way to get it replicated, including taking advantage of deduplication that will exist on the server. So to node replication is really kind of the best way to do this. It's incremental in that we only replicate the data that hasn't already been replicated. You do have the option to use dissimilar re retention policies. So if you want to keep your data for a shorter or for a longer period of time on the target server, you can do that. If you have a disaster, this is the kind of direct failover sort of thing. This is the like hot site Spectrum Protect server kind of failover. For restores and retrieves, you can have your clients automatically fail over. And then if you need to, you can convert to backup operations on the target server. At this point, that's still a manual process, um, but it can certainly be done. Container pools really, you know, kind of up the ante on, on node replication. They really have uh, added a lot of nice functionality, including the fact that it's inline deduplication and the fact that you have server-side compression. Now you're getting a very high level of data reduction. And container pools are just so much more efficient than, than our old file type pools. No device classes or volumes to manage a much improved schema on the Spectrum Protect service, a, a big improvement for, for storing this kind of data. And they introduced the new Protect Storage Pool option for replication, which is protecting the storage pool at a chunk level so it's a very efficient way of getting the data over to the, the standby site or the target site. And it gives us the opportunity then to maybe run this multiple times a day, two, three, four times a day. We can run Protect Storage Pool because it is very efficient, won't interfere to a significant extent with other workload that's going on on the Spectrum Protect server. And then to pick up the metadata, which is not copied by protect storage pool. We run the replicate node. That's our old friend there, replicate node, that will maybe once a day you do that to, to pick up the, uh, the metadata. But replicate node now runs really fast. It's because all it's got to do, it doesn't have the chunks have already been replicated via the protect storage pool. So, so replicate node just is, is picking up the metadata. Some things to think about, it, you know, and these again are kind of some of the reasons why we use node replication for electronic vaulting. No distance limitations, uh, no synchronization issues. The server knows what's been, been transferred and not been transferred. There's no need for space reclamation across the link. So some other techniques we'll look at. We can do electronic vaulting with a remote tape library, and this could be a physical library or a VTL, typically a VTL. The way this works is with specialized hardware called SAN extenders. So what happens is the library looks like it's local at your primary site, but it's really located out there at the DR site. And typically you're doing, doing this with copy storage pools. Um, it's, it looks a lot like the, the old tier one method you know, where, you're, where we're doing physical tapes, or just replacing the physical tapes with this right to this remote library. It does require that specialized SAN extension hardware. It typically doesn't work over long distances. Metro distances tend to be about the limit on this kind of thing. And you are going to have to do space reclamation on the either physical or virtual tapes you're using, and that's going to mean data transfer across the WAN. So that's one of the major drawbacks and probably one of the reasons why uh, people don't use this technique as much. Disk mirroring, I see this technique more and more often. It's a, a good way to do the electronic vaulting. You're copying your storage pools. You're copying your Spectrum Protect database using your disk storage subsystem to do the mirroring. And you do have to have to use some caution when you use this technique. And, and this is all nicely documented in the Spectrum Protect product manuals. Uh, the standpoint of maintaining the integrity of Spectrum Protect database, we do have to 
be cognizant of the order of rights. And so that means arranging your disks in something called a consistency group that's a construct within the storage sub subsystem and that maintains, maintains the right integrity so that we don't get a mismatch between uh, the Spectrum Protect database and the storage pools. And this page is just some more of the words. I'm not going to take you through all those words. You can go read more about it if you want to. But use that technique, but use it with care. One way that I think is maybe an interesting alternate to this is you can do a backup of your Spectrum Protect database and then replicate that backup and then restore it at the recovery site. That sort of takes some of those right sequencing issue out of play. Um, it does change your recovery point. It does avoid that some of those warnings that you see that are documented. Uh, for using that disk mirroring technique. It's a good technique. It's a very high recovery point. Um, typically doesn't work well across long distances, kind of like the SAN extension technique I, that we talked about earlier. Typically, metro distances are the limit with this kind of thing. But depending on the hardware, you may be able to achieve longer distances with this technique as well. One of the things I see a lot with, for electronic vaulting and continue to see is VTL replication. I kind of like this as a hardware replication technique because, well, you know, it isn't as good as node replication where Spectrum Protect is doing the heavy lifting in terms of the replication itself. VTL replication happens at the level of the virtual cartridge, and that's something we can understand from a Spectrum Protect server standpoint. And we can do a certain amount of synchronization with that. So, so we can know when a virtual cartridge has been replicated. We can know if, yeah, we got the metadata, we didn't get the metadata for that kind of cartridge. So if you're going to do hardware replication, this is the kind of replication that I really like, is doing VTL replication. and. It's got the benefit of, depending on the device, but pretty much these days they're all deduplicated. And so you get an effective deduplication across the replication as well. In other words, it only replicates the data that hasn't yet been replicated. This is a way that I really like for electronic vaulting. It doesn't have distance limitations because the replication goes across an IP link. The only downside of the VTL replication is that it's not a synchronized replication. So you have the VTL doing the storage pool replication and maybe replicating a database backup as part of that. But those two things aren't really synchronized in any way. So you can get all the metadata replicated over very quickly, but the storage pool data has to usually catch up. And so depending on when your failure occurs or when you fail over, you might have to take some actions to synchronize things a little bit there. But that's not serious. I mean, it's a thing that can be overcome, and people do overcome that. But it's just a consideration to take into account. One variation on that is to use DB2HADR. Earlier, HADR is a way to replicate your Spectrum Protect database. It replaces the idea of doing a database backup to the VTL and having the VTL replicate that backup. HADR is a built-in function of DB2. It comes with your install of Spectrum Protect. You can use it without additional licensing. It's a really nice technique for doing that. If you do HADR, you will need to have a system at the DR site to receive that, because it's a running, functioning DB2 system. It, it's not a functioning Spectrum Protect server there. You know, you, you essentially have a Spectrum Protect server built and configured, but the the Spectrum Protect piece of it is shut down, but DB2 is up and running and receiving the HADR data. So that it's a high recovery point kind of technique, but it still has those synchronization issues that we talked about earlier, maybe even more so because the metadata gets replicated very fast and usually takes a while for the storage pool data 
to catch up. Now lastly, I want to go through a couple of cloud electronic vaulting in the cloud kind of techniques. People are really just kind of getting started with these things, and so I'll just lay out some ideas for you here. Um, this is kind of the one that I think probably comes to mind for most people quickly, and that is using node replication but making the cloud as the target location. So, so there's a kind of a couple of variations on this, but one way that it can work is to actually put a Spectrum Protect server in the cloud and have it receive the data from the node replication. So now if you lose your facility at the primary site, you have a, a functioning Spectrum Protect environment, I mean server and data, database, storage pool data, all there and ready to do recovery for you there. The thing to be careful though, bandwidth, and, and not so much that bandwidth for backup because the load on backup is going to be much less than the load would be at recovery time. So you have to think about what if I you know, had to do a DR and I've got to recover hundreds of clients, am I going to be able to do that with the bandwidth from the cloud? So the environment where this really makes a lot of sense is if you're actually going to do your DR recovery in the cloud. In other words, all of your DR clients are in the cloud as well. And so now you don't have to worry about that recovery bandwidth, and it's a really, really nice way to do DR in the cloud. A couple of other variations. Some people call this a hybrid cloud solution, but it's using the IBM Cloud Object Storage, or what until recently called CleverSafe. CleverSafe is an object-based storage tool. IBM Cloud Object Storage is the, the new name for it. Set this up as your primary pool and then let the, the Cloud Object Storage device do the replication into the cloud. This is an interesting way because now I've got localized storage that's object storage for my primary pool, cloud storage that is my DR copy, and I've got the hardware managing that replication. And you know that's using the, the erasure coding technique of the IBM Cloud Object Storage. So uh, a nice way to do this, again, you have to think about bandwidth at recovery time, depending on how you're going to do the recovery. And you have to think about how the Cloud Object Storage device does that replication. It's a little different. It's not really a byte-by-byte -byte replication like a VTL would do. It's the erasure coding which sort of looks like you're writing to both devices at the same time. And so there may be some performance-related bandwidth issues if you're doing this. And they're not issues that are uh, showstoppers by any means, but just some things you have to plan for. The other thing you have to think about here is creating a copy of your database because the CleverSafe is object storage. We can't write a database backup to object storage. We can't at least not today, put our database back up to the, the CleverSafe or IBM Cloud Object Storage. So to think about an alternative there, if you want that to go into the cloud, then you have to find some way, you know, maybe an NFS-oriented kind of way to get that database back up into the cloud. We can, as kind of a variation on the cloud DR, is actually do the replication right into a cloud storage pool or into the cloud itself. You've got the same kind of issue here with the TSM database backup. You've got to get that into the cloud in some way that's outside of an object storage right. The thing that makes this work is that the cloud is doing the replication and you can Depending on your provider, the cloud provider, you can get cloud data replicated locally. You can get it replicated with geographic separation. So you can get the kind of separation that you need to do this. But remember, this is primary storage that you're writing directly into the cloud. So you've got no local storage here. You really have to think carefully about recovery bandwidth considerations, every recovery, not just the DR recoveries, 
is going to require you to get back data from the cloud. This is kind of the old way of doing it, and I just throw this in here for just completeness, but it is possible to use a piece of hardware called a cloud gateway. So we can write the normal old stuff. We did file type storage pools, sequential disk, the file device class storage pools, but you just feed them through this cloud gateway device and they'll write data out to the cloud in an object format. So it's doing the, the data conversion, the, the hardware does that. This is actually a good way to get your spectrum protected database back up into the cloud. So you could use this on the other techniques. I don't know if the cost of the gateway would justify doing it that way, but this is, that would be one option on those other techniques. In, in this example, you'd be using copy storage pools, so your primary data would stay local. Copy storage pool through the cloud gateway to the device would get it out into the cloud. Some considerations for doing vaulting to the cloud. You may or may not have to rebuild your Spectrum Protect server at the DR site. If you do node replication, of course, then you don't have to rebuild it. Or if you use a technique where you're using HADR, then you don't have to rebuild your Spectrum Protect server at the DR site. But the other techniques that we talked about are largely going to require a rebuild, and so that's why you'll want to continue to use your DRM plan file. Bandwidth is probably the biggest deal here. And again, it's really bandwidth at recovery time. Think about what are we going to do if we have to do a DR recovery? Is it practical? Is it conceivable to do that kind of a recovery from the cloud? Typically, these cloud providers, they let you put your data in, but getting it out again is where it gets really expensive. If you're expecting to do a lot of recovery from the cloud, you want to be sure you understand the cloud storage costs that are going to go with that high level of get operations from the cloud. Node replication is probably should be your go-to technique, um, but I do like a lot of the hardware replication techniques like the IBM Cloud Object Storage or CleverSafe replication or VTL replication works really well. You can combine that with HADR to get your Spectrum Protect database replicated very nicely and have a really good solution doing that. Think about the synchronization issues. That's an important consideration. It's not there with node replication. Node replication keeps everything perfectly synchronized. But all the other options are going to have, you're going to have to think about, you know, what am I going to do at recovery time? Because I might have more metadata, more Spectrum Protect database data than I've actually got storage pool data replicated. So that's what I've got for today. Let's turn it over to questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dave. The first one, cluster node is no longer supported on Linux Unix. What right. should be done instead? Well, it's no longer supported because it's no longer needed. The cluster node was there to, to make the client aware that it's functioning in a clustering environment. But in the Linux Unix world, because of the start-stop scripts, we don't really need that. So in a Linux Unix world, you just don't code it. It's not necessary. The next question was, does ransomware affect containers in our container pool? Um, Dan Thompson does say that it can impact and encrypt the Spectrum Protect server databases and disk-based storage. Anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I think Dan's right about that. And, and I think the, the, assumption is, the assumption is that ransomware can affect any online storage in the environment. And that's the reason why you know, some companies want to create this air gap. There's no way that the ransomware could conceivably affect, you know, the data that's already sitting in the vault on uh, physical tape cartridges. The next question is, if you were trying to use HADR with node replication, there would be a gap. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I'll say that um, in, I. I would think in almost all cases, if you're doing node replication, there really wouldn't be a need to do HADR. I mean, HADR replicates metadata. Node replication 
also replicates metadata. So they're, they're sort of mutually ex exclusive functions. I can't really see the scenario where you'd use them together. Okay, next. Um, the question has to do with Spectrum Protect using replicated databases. Is this officially supported or? So if the question is about replicating the database with some kind of hardware mirroring technique, and this would be typically a disk mirroring technique, um, the support for this is documented in the IBM product manuals, but that's that set of cautions that I told you about, you know, it's the consistency group thing and all of that. So, so yes, supported, but supported with those considerations that are documented. Okay, and the final one was replicate node using TS7650G using single drive. Have you done anything with that? You probably don't want to be doing node replication. I mean, it's not that you can't. You know, you're, you're, you're essentially, you're asking the VTL then, and it's a deduplication issue. You're asking the VTL to deduplicate the data when it comes in, rehydrate it when you node replicate it, and then deduplicate it again on the other side uh, when the VTL stores it there. You'd really be much better off to use the VTL replication in that environment. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dave, and thank you, everybody, for participating in today's call. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody.